Red Shadows by Robert E. Howard Chapter 4 The Black God Thrum, thrum, thrum. Somewhere, with deadening monotony, a cadence was repeated, over and over, bearing out the same theme. Fool, fool, fool. Now it was far away. Now he could stretch out his hand and almost reach it. Now it merged with the throbbing in his head until the two vibrations were as one. Fool, 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 fool. The fogs faded and vanished. Kane sought to raise his hand to his head, but found that he was bound hand and foot. He lay on the floor in a hut. Alone? He twisted about to view the place. No, two eyes glimmered at him from the darkness. Now a form took shape, and Kane, still mazed, believed that he looked on the man who had struck him unconscious. Yet no, this man could never strike such a blow. He was lean, withered, and wrinkled. The only thing that seemed alive about him were his eyes, and they seemed like the eyes of a snake. The man squatted on the floor of the hut, near the doorway, naked save for a loincloth and the usual paraphernalia of bracelets, anklets, and armlets. Weird fetishes of ivory, bone, and hide, animal and human, adorned his arms and legs. Suddenly and unexpectedly, he spoke in English. Ha! Ah, you wake, white man. Why you come here, eh? Cain asked the inevitable question, following the habit of the Caucasian. You speak my language. How is that? The black man grinned. I slave. Long time, me boy. Mean longa, juju man. Me great fetish. No black man like me. You white man, you hunt brother? Cain snarled. I? Brother? I seek a man, yes. The negro nodded. Maybe so you find him, huh? He dies. Again the negro grinned. Me powerful juju man, he announced apropos of nothing. He bent closer. White man you hunt. Eyes like leopard, huh? Yes? Ha 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 ha. Listen, white man. Man with eyes of a leopard. He and Chief Sanga make powerful palaver. They blood brothers now. Say nothing. I help you. You help me, eh? Why should you help me? asked Kane suspiciously. The juju man bent closer and whispered, White man Sanga's right hand man. Sanga more powerful than Longa. White man mighty juju. Longa white brother kill man with eyes of a leopard. Be blood brother to Nlonga. Nlonga be more powerful than Sanga. Palava set. And like a dusky ghost, he floated out of the hut so swiftly that King was not sure but that the whole affair was a dream. Without, King could see the flare of fires. The drums were still booming, but close at hand the tones merged and mingled, and the impulse-producing vibrations were lost. All seemed a barbaric clamor without rhyme or reason, yet there was an undertone of mockery there, savage and gloating. Lies, thought Cain, his mind still swimming. Jungle lies, like jungle women that lure a man to his doom. Two warriors entered the hut, black giants, hideous with paint and armed with crude spears. They lifted the white man and carried him out of the hut. They bore him across an open space, leaned him upright against a post, and bound him there. About him, behind him and to the side, a great semicircle of black faces leered and faded in the firelight as the flames leapt and sank. There in front of him loomed a shape hideous and obscene, a black, formless thing, a grotesque parody of the human. Still brooding, blood-stained, like the formless soul of Africa, the horror, the black god. And in front and to each side, upon roughly carven thrones of teakwood, sat two men. He who sat upon the right was a black man, huge, ungainly, a gigantic and unlovely mass of dusky flesh and muscles. Small, hog-like eyes blinked out over sin-marked cheeks, huge, flabby red lips pursed in fleshy haughtiness. The other? Ah, monsieur, we meet again. The speaker was far from being the debonair villain who had taunted Cain in the cavern among the mountains. His clothes were rags. There were more lines in his face. He had sunk lower in the years that had passed. Yet his eyes still gleamed and danced with their old recklessness, and his voice held the same mocking timber. The last time I heard that accursed voice, said Cain calmly, was in a cave, in darkness, whence you fled like a hunted rat. Ay, under different conditions, answered Le Loup imperturbably. What did you do after blundering about like an elephant in the dark? Cain hesitated, then. I left the mountain. 
By the front entrance? Yes, I might have known you were too stupid to find the secret door. Hoofs of the devil. Had you thrust against the chest with the golden lock which stood against the wall, the door had opened to you and revealed the secret passageway through which I went. I traced you to the nearest port, and there took ship and followed you to Italy, where I found you had gone. Aye, by the saints, you nearly cornered me in Florence. Ho, 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 I was climbing through a back window while Monsieur Galahad was battering down the front door of the tavern. And had your horse not gone lame, you would have caught up with me on the road to Rome. Again, the ship on which I left Spain had barely put out to sea when Monsieur Galahad rides up to the wharfs. Why have you followed me like this? I do not understand. Because you are a rogue whom it is my destiny to kill, answered Cain coldly. He did not understand. All his life he had roamed about the world, aiding the weak and fighting oppression. He neither knew nor questioned why. That was his obsession, his driving force of life. Cruelty and tyranny to the weak sent a red blaze of fury, fierce and lasting, through his soul. When the full flame of his hatred was weakened and loosed, there was no rest for him until his vengeance had been fulfilled to the uttermost. If he thought of it at all, he considered himself a fulfiller of God's judgment, a vessel of wrath to be emptied upon the souls of the unrighteous. Yet in the full sense of the word, Solomon Cain was not wholly a Puritan, though he thought of himself as such. Le Loup shrugged his shoulders. I could understand had I wronged you personally. Mon Dieu, I too would follow an enemy across the world, but, though I would have joyfully slain and robbed you, I never heard of you until you declared war on me. Cain was silent, his still fury overcoming him. Though he did not realize it, the wolf was more than merely an enemy to him. The bandit symbolized, to Cain, all the things against which the Puritan had fought all his life, cruelty, outrage, oppression, and tyranny. Leloup broke in on his vengeful meditations. "'What did you do with the treasure, which, gods of Hades, took me years to accumulate? Devil take it, I had time only to snatch a handful of coins and trinkets as I ran. I took such as I needed to hunt you down. The rest I gave to the villages which you had looted.' "'Sent in the devil!' swore Leloup. "'Monsieur, you are the greatest fool I have yet met. To throw that vast treasure... By Satan, I rage to think of it on the hands of base peasants, vile villagers. Yet, ho, 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 they will steal and kill each other for it. That is human nature. Yes, damn you, flamed Cain suddenly, showing that his conscience had not been at rest. Doubtless they will, being fools. Yet what could I do? Had I left it there, people might have starved and gone naked for lack of it. More, it would have been found, and theft and slaughter would have followed anyway. You are to blame. For had this treasure been left with its rightful owners, no such trouble would have ensued. The wolf grinned without reply. Cain, not being a profane man, his rare curses had double effect and always startled his hearers, no matter how vicious or hardened they might be. It was Cain who spoke next. Why have you fled from me across the world? You do not really fear me. No, you are right. Really, I do not know. Perhaps flight is a habit which is difficult to break. I made my mistake when I did not kill you that night in the mountains. I am sure I could kill you in a fair fight, yet I have never even and now sought to ambush you. Somehow I have not had liking to meet you, monsieur. A whim of mine, a mere whim. Then, mon dieu, mayhap I have enjoyed a new sensation, and I had thought that I had exhausted the thrills of life. And then a man must either be the hunter or the hunted. Until now, monsieur, I was the hunted but I grew weary of the role. I thought I had thrown you off the trail. A negro slave, brought from this vicinity, told a Portugal ship captain of a white man who landed from a Spanish ship and went into the jungle. I heard of it and hired the ship, paying the captain to bring me here. Monsieur, I admired you for your attempt, but you must admire me too. Alone I came into this village, and alone among savages and cannibals I, with some slight knowledge of the language learned from a slave aboard ship, I gained the confidence of King Songo and supplanted that murmur no longer. I am a braver man than you, monsieur, for I had no ship to retreat to, and a ship is waiting for you. I admire your courage, said Cain, but you are content to rule amongst cannibals, you the blackest soul of them all. I intend to return to my own people when I have slain you. Your confidence would be admirable were it not amusing. Oh, Gulka! A giant negro stalked into the space between them. 
He was the hugest man that Cain had ever seen, though he moved with cat-like ease and suppleness. His arms and legs were like trees, and the great sinuous muscles rippled with each motion. His ape-like head was set squarely between gigantic shoulders. His great, dusky hands were like the talons of an ape, and his brow slanted back from above bestial eyes. Flat nose and great, thick red lips completed this picture of primitive, lustful savagery. "'This is Golka, the gorilla slayer,' said Laloop. "'He it was who lay in wait beside the trail and smote you down. "'You are like a wolf yourself, Monsieur Kane. "'But since your ship hove into sight, you have been watched by many eyes, "'and had you had all the powers of a leopard, you had not seen Golka nor heard him. "'He hunts the most terrible and crafty of all beasts in their native forests, far to the north, the beasts who walk like men, as that one whom he slew some days since. Cain, following Leloup's fingers, made out a curious man-like thing dangling from a roof-pole of a hut. A jagged end thrust through the thing's body held it there. Cain could scarcely distinguish its characteristics by the firelight, but there was a weird, human-like semblance about the hideous, hairy thing. A female gorilla that Golka slew and brought back to the village, said Leloup. The giant black slouched close to Cain and stared into the white man's eyes. Cain returned his gaze somberly, and presently the negro's eyes dropped sullenly, and he slouched back a few paces. The look in the Puritan's grim eyes had pierced the primitive hazes of the gorilla slayer's soul, and for the first time in his life he felt fear. To throw this off, he tossed a challenging look about, then, with unexpected animalness, he struck his huge chest resoundingly, grinned cavernously, and flexed his mighty arms. No one spoke. Primordial bestiality had the stage, and the more highly developed types looked on with various feelings of amusement, tolerance, or contempt. Golka glanced furtively at Cain to see if the white man was watching him, then, with a sudden beastly roar, plunged forward and dragged a man from the semicircle. While the trembling victim screeched for mercy, the giant hurled him upon the crude altar before the shadowy idol. A spear rose and flashed, and the screeching ceased. The black god looked on, his monstrous features seeming to leer in the flickering firelight. He had drunk. Was the black god pleased with the draft, with the sacrifice? Golka walked back, and, stopping before Cain, flourished the bloody spear before the white man's face. The loop laughed. Then suddenly Nalonga appeared. He came from nowhere in particular. Suddenly he was standing there, beside the post to which Cain was bound. A lifetime of study of the art of illusion had given the Juju man a highly technical knowledge of appearing and disappearing, which, after all, consisted only in timing the audience's attention. He waved Golka aside with a grand gesture, and the gorilla man slunk back, apparently to get out of Nalonga's gaze. Then, with incredible swiftness, he turned and struck the Juju man a terrific blow upon the side of the head with his open hand. Nalonga went down like a felled ox, and in an instant he had been seized and bound to the post close to Cain. An uncertain murmuring rose from the negroes, which died out as King Sanga stared angrily toward them. Leloup leaned back upon his throne and laughed uproariously. "'The trail ends here, Monsieur Galahad. That ancient fool thought I did not know of his plotting. I was hiding outside the hut and heard the interesting conversation you two had. <laughs> "'Ha, The black god must drink, Monsieur, but I have persuaded Sanga to have you two burnt. That will be much more enjoyable.' though we shall have to forgo the usual feast, I fear, for after the fires are lit about your feet, the devil himself could not keep your carcasses from becoming charred frames of bone. Sanga shouted something imperiously, and blacks came bearing wood, which they piled about the feet of Nalonga and Cain. The juju man had recovered consciousness, and he now shouted something in his native language. Again the murmuring rose among the shadowy throng. Sanga snarled something in reply. Cain gazed at the scene almost impersonally. Again, somewhere in his soul, dim primal deeps were stirring, age-old thought memories veiled in the fogs of lost eons. He had been here before, thought Cain. He knew all this of old, the lord flames beating back the sullen night, the bestial faces leering expectantly, and the god, the black god, there in the shadows. Always the black god, brooding back in the shadows. He had known the shouts, the frenzied chant of the worshippers, back there in the grey dawn of the world the speech of the bellowing drums, the singing priests, the repellent, inflaming, all-pervading scent of freshly spilt blood. All this have I known somewhere, sometime, thought Cain. Now I am the main actor. 
he became aware that someone was speaking to him through the roar of the drums. He had not realized that the drums had begun to boom again. The speaker was Nalonga. Me powerful juju man. Watch now. I work mighty magic. Songa! His voice rose in a screech that drowned out the wildly clamoring drums. Songa grinned at the words Nalonga screamed at him. The chant of the drums now had dropped to a low, sinister monotone, and Cain plainly heard Leloup when he spoke. Nalonga says that he will now work that magic which it is death to speak even. Never before has it been worked in the sight of living men. It is the nameless juju magic. Watch closely, monsieur. Possibly we shall be further amused. The wolf laughed lightly and sardonically. A black man stooped, applying a torch to the wood about Cain's feet. Tiny jets of flame began to leap up and catch. Another bent to do the same with Nalonga, then hesitated. The juju man sagged in his bonds, his head drooped upon his chest. He seemed dying. The loop leaned forward, cursing. Feet of the devil! Is the scoundrel about to cheat us of our pleasure of seeing him writhe in the flames? The warrior gingerly touched the wizard and said something in his own language. Leloup laughed. He died of fright! A great wizard by the... His voice trailed off suddenly. The drum stopped as if the drummers had fallen dead simultaneously. Silence dropped like a fog upon the village, and in the stillness Cain heard only the sharp crackle of the flames whose heat he was beginning to feel. All eyes turned upon the dead man upon the altar, for the corpse had begun to move. First a twitching of a hand, then an aimless motion of an arm, a motion which gradually spread over the body and limbs. Slowly, with blind, uncertain gestures, the dead man turned upon his side. The trailing limbs found the earth. Then, horribly, like something being born, like some frightful reptilian thing bursting the shell of non-existence, the corpse tottered and reared upright, standing on legs wide apart and stiffly braced, arms still making useless, infantile motions. Utter silence, save somewhere a man's quick breath sounded loud in the stillness. Cain stared, for the first time in his life smitten speechless and thoughtless. To his Puritan mind this was Satan's hand manifested. The loop sat on his throne, eyes wide and staring, hands still half-raised in the careless gesture he was making when frozen into silence by the unbelievable sight. Songa sat beside him, mouth and eyes wide open, fingers making curious jerky motions upon the carved arms of the throne. Now the corpse was upright, swaying on stilt-like legs, body tilting far back until the sightless eyes seemed to stare straight into the red moon that was just rising over the black jungle. The thing tottered uncertainly in a wide, erratic half-circle, arms flung out grotesquely as if in balance, then swayed about to face the two thrones and the black god. A burning twig at Cain's feet cracked like the crash of a cannon in the tense silence. The horror thrust forth a black foot. It took a wavering step. Another. Then with stiff, jerky, and automaton-like steps, legs straddled far apart, the dead man came toward the two who sat in speechless horror to each side of the black god. Ah! Uh. From somewhere came the explosive sigh, from the shadowy semicircle where crouched the terror-fascinated worshippers. Straight on stalked the grim specter. Now it was within three strides of the thrones, and Leloup, faced by fear for the first time in his bloody life, cringed back in his chair, while Sangha, with a superhuman effort breaking the chains of horror that held him helpless, shattered the knight with a wild scream, and, springing to his feet, lifted a spear, shrieking and gibbering in wild menace. Then, as the ghastly thing halted not its frightful advance, he hurled the spear with all the power of his great black muscles, and the spear tore through the dead man's breast with a rending of flesh and bone. Not an instant halted the thing, for the dead die not, and Sangha the king stood frozen, arms outstretched as if to fend off the terror. An instant they stood so, leaping firelight and eerie moonlight etching the scene forever in the minds of the beholders. The changeless, staring eyes of the corpse looked full into the bulging eyes of Sangha, where were reflected all the hells of horror. Then, with a jerky motion, the arms of the thing went out and up. The dead hands fell on Sangha's shoulders. At the first touch, the king seemed to shrink and shrivel, and with a scream that was to haunt the dreams of every watcher through all the rest of time, Sangha crumpled and fell and the dead man reeled stiffly and fell with him. Motionless lay the two at the feet of the black god, and to Cain's dazed mind it seemed that the idol's great inhuman eyes were fixed upon them with terrible still laughter. 
At the instant of the king's fall, a great shout went up from the blacks, and Cain, with a clarity lent his subconscious mind by the depths of his hate, looked for Leloup and saw him spring from his throne and vanish in the darkness. Then vision was blurred by a rush of black figures who swept into the space before the god. Feet knocked aside the blazing brands whose heat Cain had forgotten, and dusky hands freed him. Others loosed the wizard's body and laid it upon the earth. Cain dimly understood that the blacks believed this thing to be the work of Nalonga, and that they connected the vengeance of the wizard with himself. He bent, laid a hand on the juju man's shoulder. No doubt of it, he was dead. The flesh was already cold. He glanced at the other corpses. Sanga was dead too, and the thing that had slain him now lay without movement. Cain started to rise, then halted. Was he dreaming, or did he really feel a sudden warmth in the dead flesh he touched? Mind reeling, he again bent over the wizard's body, and slowly he felt warmness steal over the limbs and the blood begin to flow sluggishly through the veins again. Then Nalonga opened his eyes and stared up into Cain's, with the blank expression of a newborn babe. Cain watched, flesh crawling, and saw the knowing, reptilian glitter come back, saw the wizard's thick lips part in a wide grin. Nalonga sat up, and a strange chant arose from the negroes. Cain looked about. The blacks were all kneeling, swaying their bodies to and fro, and in their shouts Cain caught the word Nalonga, repeated over and over in a kind of fearsome, ecstatic refrain of terror and worship. As the wizard rose, they all fell prostrate. Nalonga nodded, as if in satisfaction. "'Great juju! Great fetish! Me!' he announced to Cain. "'You see, my ghost go out!' Kill Sanga, come back to me. Great magic, great fetish, me. Cain glanced at the black god looming back in the shadows, at Nalanga, who now flung out his arms toward the idol as if in invocation. I am everlasting, Cain thought the black god said. I drink, no matter who rules, chiefs, slayers, wizards. They pass like the ghosts of dead men through the gray jungle. I stand, I rule, I am the soul of the jungle said the black god. Suddenly Cain came back from the illusory mists in which he had been wandering. The white man! Which way did he flee? Nalonga shouted something. A score of dusky hands pointed. From somewhere Cain's rapier was thrust out to him. The fogs faded and vanished. Again he was the avenger, the scourge of the unrighteous. With the sudden volcanic speed of a tiger he snatched the sword and was gone. End of chapter